Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Joyce Gomez, and I am an associate professor in the Department of Literacy and Reading Education at California State University, Fullerton. The topic of this screencast today is culturally responsive literacy instruction. A little bit of uh, additional background about myself. Um, in addition to being an associate professor here at Cal State Fullerton, I'm a mother of two young daughters. I was born and raised in Southern California, though I did teach in Las Vegas, Nevada for several years. I taught at the primary level and I served as a literacy specialist. Um, the, some of the research topics that I really am passionate about include social justice and teacher education, as well as culturally responsive and sustaining approaches to response to intervention implementation and other data-driven models. You can also learn more about some of the work that I'm doing through my Instagram page noted here. So let's get started. Um, Throughout the presentation, I try to include various questions that I hope serve as opportunities to engage in uh, self-reflection and, and analysis. I want to begin by asking us to think about how we might define literacy. Um, what does it look like? What does it entail? And how might that impact or shape the way we approach literacy instruction and assessment? So for instance, what constitutes what we uh, see as valuable, valuable literacy learning and assets and knowledge that our students are bringing into the classroom. And what we do with those conceptualizations might impact the way we uh, shape our pedagogy, um, how we affirm the, that strength and knowledge that our students are bringing with them and also how we engage with the curriculum. So let, let's explore that through a historical lens. Dewitt and colleagues argue that conceptualizations of literacy really have evolved quite a bit over time. Early ideas of this might have included, you know, um, signing your name. The ability to sign your name was a, a form of literacy or perceived as, as a form of literacy. Reciting passages from a text such as a biblical text, or perhaps more recently, high performance assessment success. Um, and so we want to think about the possibility of literacy as a social construction. If social definitions of literacy serve a large role in how it's defined and where specifically we place value, again, we want to think about how that aligns with our philosophies of teaching and learning and how we um, make space for broader, deeper understandings of literacy within our diverse school communities. Dewitt and colleagues go on to argue that present day literacy also involves some of the following. This includes a deep comprehension of text, active connections to prior knowledge. So students, having the capacity to draw from that schema in a very explicit and intentional way and to say like, oh, this is what I know about this topic that I'm reading about. Um, this is what I'm learning. Here are my views and thoughts about this. Here's my analysis here even is my pushback on that. And not just certain forms of text, but really a wide array of text. So when we think about ourselves as adults engaging with diverse forms of text and literacy. This can include everything from like poetry and song lyrics to tax forms and other legal documents. So we want our kiddos to be able to also successfully engage with a, a wide array of, of text. Uh, this goes along with the idea of application of knowledge to appropriate context and really having a firm understanding of the purpose that literacy and reading serve in a broader social context. And of course, producing knowledge. So we don't want students to only be able to consume um, messages, authors intended messages, but to critically push back on those, uh, to make connections across them, and to produce their own insights and to share their perspectives in various ways, whether that's through verbal communication, 
presentations or writing, we want them to be able to engage in a broader dialogue. So let's also go back to our own literacy journeys. How might those also shape the way we think about literacy and how it's defined? So in this self-analysis reflection activity, uh, we could think about um, literacy as a lunchbox. If we were to pack a lunchbox or bag with some items, that represent our literacy knowledge, what might those items include? What are some artifacts that represent those points in time? What are some items that maybe elicit memories of your past experiences with literacy? So some exa examples that come to my mind include those cassette tapes that share audio read-alouds of various uh, storybooks. They would come in these little plastic bags and they would come with the matching cassette, meaning like the cassette color would match the color of the dominant color in the book cover. Um, and you'd have a couple different stories. The ones in my personal collection reflected a lot of Disney stories. We'd listen to those. Um, what are some items that you would place in your literacy box? And what does that represent for you? What are some anecdotes that are connected to those items? Also, how did those items and experiences shape your perceptions of literacy and the ways you saw yourself as a reader, speaker, or listener? And finally, in what ways do elements of your own intersecting social identities influence your literacy lunch box, uh, box items or experiences? So for me, thinking about those Disney cassette tapes, uh, they presented to me a lot of views of, of gender, a lot of those Disney princess books gave me insights into um, like broader conversations or perceptions about um, roles of females or young girls in the broader social fabric. Um, they also, though, um, gave me some insights to the 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 fantasy and imagination uh, that comes through literacy, whether that's reading something on your own or having the experience of somebody read something aloud to you. So all of those different experiences uh, shaped how I view literacy and literacy learning. For me, I think back on those experiences really fondly they um, contributed to, you know, the shaping of my love for reading and literacy, specifically being read aloud to or to conduct a read aloud. But also, of course, um, as I continued to engage in research and reflection around literacy messages, thinking about representation and how we can broaden these intersexually driven uh, forms of representation throughout curricular materials. So that brings us to the idea of cultural responsiveness. And in the um, image that you see on the right-hand side of your screen, we can, we can note some of the different areas of scholarship that have touched upon these ideas of really using and leveraging students' cultural knowledge, prior experiences, frames of reference, um, and identities as a way to unpack their understandings of and continued engagement with literacy and reading concepts. So as um, Geneva Gay describes here in this quote, we're really drawing from those in a very intentional way to enhance the learning experiences of our students and to really make learning more meaningful and relevant to, to their broader communities. And so we want to not only be responsive to those identities, but create a space where those can continue to be uh, sustained and shaped, meaning we don't want to just reflect students' identities, but we want to create pedagogical approaches and moves that allow students to embrace 
<clears throat> all elements of their learning and identities. One example being um, language. If our students are coming into classrooms speaking a wide array of languages, what are the spaces in which they can utilize vocabulary knowledge or uh, linguistic repertoires to uh, enhance their experiences engaging in communication with their peers as they co-construct learning experiences. Um, Aleem and Paris explain that when we think about sustaining instruction, we want experiences in the classroom to be additive rather than subtractive. So we have a video here to kind of illustrate this idea a bit further. Our student community is made up of all types of learners. Culturally responsive teaching is capitalizing on all that students bring into the classroom oh. and their personal lives and their identities. And respecting that, using that to create classrooms that are powerful and meaningful. You need to know who your students are, their backgrounds, their interests, their family. And using that is going to be your number one tool in driving your instruction. That's how you make it relevant to them. That's how you make it exciting for them because they see themselves in the text. They see themselves in the examples. My cultural heritage was largely absent from my school experience. And I don't want students to go through that. I want them to be able to explore the richness of their identity and the identity of their neighbors. This made Grace sad for two reasons. She didn't like Natalie, and she didn't have a daddy of her own. She couldn't imagine. Thanks a lot for that, Carla. That means a lot. Um, why don't John Carlos, why don't you come up first? I would like to dedicate this class to my grandpa. He's an immigrant, and he knew very little English. Any school should and can know who their students are and what they're doing in the classroom. And use that to, to strengthen their teaching and their support for their students. So as the video pointed out, we use and leverage students' identities to enhance learning experiences. And when we think about um, culturally responsive and sustaining approaches, I also wanna note that um, in addition to thinking about students' cultural uh, heritage, we also can um, broaden our conceptualizations of identity by applying um, this intersectionality lens. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw is a key scholar who's shaped and formulated our understandings of what constitutes um, intersectionally driven understandings of identity um, in that she has helped us um, uh, think about the connections between elements of identity. A lot of her work talks specifically about the intersections of gender, race, and socioeconomic status, and how those don't live in vacuums, but rather they shape one another. And while that can certainly be uh, a really exciting element of identity, at the same time, it can um, also be a space in which students are experiencing multiple degrees of oppression in that they might experience marginalization as, you know, girls of color, for instance, or girls of color um, in low socioeconomic conditions or context. Uh, if these ideas of broader social um, inequities aren't really addressed or um, 
uh, considered as part of teachers' instructional approaches or considerations in terms of supporting students. So we want to make sure that we're when we're thinking about cultural responsiveness, we're also thinking about these multifaceted elements of students' identities that will uh, inevitably also play a role in how they think about and and um, engage with literacy. Thinking just about our own experiences, how how reasonable is it to think about our own areas of identity in these compartmentalized silos, but rather recognizing that elements such as culture and language really do live across each other. They, there's this reciprocal relationship between them. And so um, naturally culture and language will, will shape the way students engage with um, literacy and reading experiences in classrooms as they engage with curriculum. So I wanna also present a video um, that, uh, that offers some words from Kimberly Crenshaw as she speaks to these topics. Metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem, it's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom between teachers and students, between students and other students, between students and administrators, and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students, regardless of their identity. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit. It is a relationship between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development, to opportunities in the school for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. So it's with that complexity factor in mind that we also think about how to structure um, classroom instruction in the way that we're allowed to um, learn more about students' backgrounds and insights. I have this example from my own da daughter who um, saw my sister's and my handprint in my parents' backyard. Um, my my dad has had built a basketball court of sorts in in the backyard. There's the basketball rim. There's like a blocks of cement that are painted green. They have the white lines. And as he built that, my sister and I put our handprints in 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 the cement. And my daughter saw those and said that she wanted her handprints to be added as well. And my dad made a deal with her you get to put your handprint in the cement once you've shot 100 baskets. So it took her about a year, but she shot 100 baskets with grandpa. And so here's a picture of the cement, what cement he laid out so that she could add her handprint and name to, to the cement. And I share this story only to illustrate um, this idea of resilience and dedication um, and, and how that might be leveraged in a classroom. 
right? So how do we create spaces to learn more about our students' um, reflections of their, their grit, their resilience, their persistence outside the four walls of our classroom? How do we learn more about those funds of knowledge that they have um, in their broader communities and how do we help apply that to their classroom learning, um, whether that's phonics or fluency or comprehension, how do we make those connections um, in a very intentional way? So we want to create these spaces where we can learn more about students. And here I just have some examples of creating spaces for voice, whether that's tell me your name stories or digital stories, how do we learn more about students' backgrounds and identities and how do we create opportunities for ourselves to unpack our personal biases and assumptions along the way, really recognizing, recognizing that this is ongoing work. And just one example of this could be just representations in some of our instructional materials, including children's books, whether this is at the primary elementary level or high school level. Um, one example here is some ongoing research that comes out of the Cooperative Children's Book Center, where they take published books and analyze uh, cultural representation across them. And here you can see uh, to the right uh, uh, what's grown to be a very popular image, we can visually see the disproportionate representation we see in children's books. As you can see, there's certain groups that get represented more extensively than others. And one interesting insight here is the representation of animals and not to speak poorly about animals in children's books. I personally grew up reading Berenstein Bear books, for instance, and they will always hold those special places in my heart. But if students are more likely to see uh, fictional animals in books than their own cultural heritage, um, we miss the opportunity to help them see themselves in text and to make personal connections to what they're learning in classrooms or to see themselves as, you know, active participants in the process of of reading and writing and literacy more broadly. And just one example here is just like picture books were four times more likely to represent a dinosaur than a child of Native American heritage, and two times more likely to represent a rabbit than a child of Asian Pacific heritage. And we just want to make sure that we're very mindful of the extent to which we are developing libraries and classroom spaces that that represents students' cultural backgrounds, but then also going back to this idea of intersectionality, really represent intersectional identities. And in addition to just making sure we're representing these elements of identity, we wanna make sure that we're thoughtful about our critical evaluation of the ways in which identities are represented. So as an independent exercise, I invite you to review the book Skippy John Jones and to think about how um, to think about some of these following questions. And you can apply these questions to other books as well as you think about what to add to your shelf. And you can invite students to engage in these questions, thinking about um, developing comprehension skills. We want our students to be critical consumers of text. That can include a picture book, that can include a bulletin board or a marketing ad or what they see on social media. So asking or creating spaces for them to ask questions such as who is being represented in this piece of text? How are they being represented? What messages are being delivered through the text? So these are the kinds of questions we can ask ourselves to not only be mindful of who are representing, but again, how they're being represented. Uh, I have also some additional sources that can serve to inform our thinking and analysis of curricular materials and their representations. Uh, 
One note here is the culturally responsive curriculum scorecard, which comes out of NYU. That's a tool that folks can use to critically evaluate the curriculum in their schools. Um, I also invite you as an independent exercise to engage in, in a, a text walk. Um, exploring some of the following websites and then also just kind of laying out some of the books in your classroom library and thinking about some of the following, such as like what intersectional identities are you seeing represented? How are they represented? Um, and how might they serve goals related to reading development? So for instance, thinking about what books might lend themselves to really great lessons that capture a key vocabulary, key, key tier two vocabulary that you want to um, introduce to students, or what are some books that really illustrate alliteration very well, going back to, you know, our lessons on phonological awareness, how might you, again, make the connection between um, cultural responsiveness and just really solid literacy and reading instruction, recognizing that they're not separate, but rather cultural responsiveness is the lens through which we develop our Lead a uh, literacy and reading lesson plans. And then going back to these electronic resources, I invite you to explore this website, which looks at the poetry of hip hop. And so there's actually a broad scholarship on hip hop pedagogy um, and how um, that can also be an example of how we can leverage student identity as we foster literacy and reading instruction, but also thinking about the, the role of lyrics, right, as being um, part of our broader understanding of what constitutes curricular materials. So uh, recognizing that we could print out um, uh, song lyrics and engage in analysis of the language that we see represented, the symbolism that we see represented, or even just like specific phonics patterns or rhyming patterns that we wanna eliminate as part of a lesson. And so I invite you to check out that resource to learn more about um, hip hop and its role in poetry. And also I have here some links to additional song lyrics that can be uh, utilized in, in multiple languages. So we have some in Korean and Spanish, but I invite you to check out more. And always as a, as a caveat, when you're exploring the use of uh, song lyrics to be very mindful of your audience and their age and the um, appropriateness of specific materials for young audiences. So I, I share that caveat as um, I share these particular resources because you always want to apply that preview before you use these resources with, with kiddos. I also want to talk more about exploring student narratives with intentionality. So by, by intentionality, I mean being very mindful and purposeful in how you create these spaces to learn more about students and to reflect their identities. And that begins with you know, fostering dialogue across a team of people who are fully committed to supporting that student. And we wanna think about who's sitting at that table. How do we make sure all of these perspectives are included in our development of instructional plans? In other words, like how do we create opportunities to gather feedback from parents or families or the students themselves, uh, also multiple collaborators at the school, um, including special education teachers, general education teachers, literacy specialists, administrators, all of the folks who serve as key players in that student's success and development. How do we make sure that we're drawing from all of those pieces of information to develop a plan that's as effective as possible. And by intentionality, I also uh, want to, well, in, in the name of intentionality, I also want to share some examples in, to illustrate what this could look like. So these photo centers um, come from 
uh, some scholarship from Lamont and Henderson, and they did this study with classroom teachers that involved um, taking photos of the surrounding school community and using those as kind of like the launching point for writing activities for kiddos. So um, students, they found that students' writing was much more robust and rich when they were able to speak to some of the photos in this activity. So kiddos would literally say things like, that's my uncle's truck. And it would really spark these insights and um, students were really excited to share and engage with the writing activities. The study also notes how students uh, took ownership of this literacy knowledge, recognizing that a lot of the ABC books they've seen in their time don't really reflect their identities or communities, so they constructed their own using some of those photos. And you can see an example of uh, page B, if you will, reflected here in the right-hand side of the page. Another way we can gain more insight to students' knowledge is through translanguaging. So similarly, there's a huge scholarship in this topic, but what I wanna illustrate here is the idea of creating spaces for students to um, engage with literacy in multiple languages or to share their knowledge or questions using different languages or linguistic repertoires to engage in that effective meaning making. And here, uh, this example of Project Recuerdo comes out of the work of Lopez and colleagues. And this reflects a group of teachers who um, put together a curriculum for the year with the goal to represent students' cultural backgrounds and, and knowledge. And just a snapshot from that work here is um, some of the uh, um, of some of the ofrendas that they developed during Dia de los Muertos, um, the students not only displayed the ofrendas and spoke to them during presentations where their classmates could walk through and, and visit, but they also wrote letters from the perspectives of their loved ones who had passed. So here you see um, the use of multiple forms of literacy, including speaking and writing, uh, but it also allows teachers to gain these insights to students' families and experiences and culture, and in turn allows the students to also showcase their knowledge and understanding um, through their experiences um, and insights informed by their identities. Um, we can also think about inclusion as a, an important part of this process, thinking about universal design for learning as an example of how we can use intentional pedagogical moves to create spaces for students to engage in meaningful learning. So thinking about multiple forms in which students can engage with content, whether that's through um, visual representations, audio representations, digital experiences, um, hard copy materials, also providing for them multiple means of representation. In other words, what are the different ways in which students can represent their knowledge? Some might be more inclined to develop a web page than to write a formal paper. Are, are those more effective opportunities for the students to showcase their knowledge of particular elements of content? Um, so thinking about these different ways in which students can engage with the material to meet these goals. And lastly, I want to illustrate this relationship between literacy and culturally responsive teaching. Uh, DeWitt and colleagues talk about eight essential components to literacy achievement, which I'll discuss, um, specifically sharing how cultural responsiveness can work with that those essential components to enhance learning. So the first important component is motivation. And so recognizing that students are more likely to engage in effective literacy development if they're motivated, we wanna help um, 
develop lessons and experiences that are meaningful. In other words, how do we help students see the purpose of what they're doing? So here's where we can, again, draw from their experiences at home with literacy, whether that's oral storytelling, game night, their development of recipe books that are maybe passed down through families, the development of shopping lists. All of those things can be incorporated into our classrooms to help foster learning around specific areas of reading or literacy. And I have here just an example of three generations of of women and girls playing Loteria, a bilingual game in this case that allows them to um, foster vocabulary in English and Spanish. A uh, second important component is finding engaging reading materials. So this goes back to um, our earlier discussion of representation. And this, of course, can also be um, tied to our conversation about diversifying the types of text that we have. So really thinking about what genres, what forms of text, what languages um, can we connect students to to make sure that their, their literacy and reading experiences are relevant and meaningful. So I have here a couple links to digital text as well, if we wanna think about making sure students have access, but we can also diversify the types of text that students have access to, whether that's graphic novels or poems or picture books or magazines, and thinking about how we can help students make those connections. And a third element is phonemic awareness. So this is the ability for students to identify and manipulate the sounds within spoken word. So for instance, although the English alphabet has 26 letters, we see 44 different sounds represented. So here's some examples. When we think about the phonemes in a word, these are the smallest, un smallest units of sound. The word dog has three letters. It also has three phonemes, d, a, g. But the word shape, although it has one, two, three, four, five letters, it has three phonemes because S and H together make the sound sh. And A along with the E at the end make the sound A, and then we have the P. So in enhancing students' awareness uh, and understanding of phonemes, uh, whether that's deleting phonemes, substituting them, adding them, segmenting them, blending them, so forth, um, sets them up for success with ongoing reading. So we can engage students in um, experiences with songs, nursery rhymes, and these can be in English or a variety of other languages as shared here to um, further enhance their knowledge of this topic. And we can play sound games where we manipulate the sounds in words. And again, this can be in English or Spanish or a variety of other languages. Also along the lines of oral language development, in addition to using sentence frames or opportunities, multiple opportunities to share, whether that's small group, cooperative learning structures, or whole group, uh, we could draw from translanguaging strategies um, to create spaces for students to share in, in, in what they see as safe environments. And to further illustrate this idea, I'm gonna invite folks to read uh, page four of Catherine Oz's 1985 article on the talk story. Um, two questions that I would invite folks to kind of keep in mind as you read, it's a really small section, is how is joint performance in the article leveraged to enhance reading comprehension? And two, what are some other examples of oral traditions we see reflected in our students' cultures? how could those serve as bridges to reading instruction? So just some background on this article. 
Catherine Odd did some research in Hawaii and noted how although traditional historical classrooms called for students to kind of be seated in these rows where they'd raise their hands and one at a time would be called on to share their ideas with the class, in Hawaiian communities, uh, students or children rather would um, kind of co-construct stories orally. So one student might start, but then call on someone else to share and offer more details about what happened. And then others would jump in and share. So there was this like active co-construction of, of an oral uh, recounting of an experience. And so in the article, uh, Catherine Ott talks more about how that can be used um, it, with teachers to leverage um, dialogue around books to enhance and foster comprehension. And so it's just a, a seminal piece that showcases how we can draw from our understanding of cultural norms and traditions in our student communities to help um, create spaces for them to actively engage with the content and material in the four, within the four walls of our classroom. Another important element of literacy success is phonics and other word recognition skills. And phonics is really the process of giving sounds to the letters of the alphabet and really just sharing with students the rules around these codes. Like how do they, what are the rules associated with written text and how it's read and the meaning connected to it to show, uh, to share knowledge with others, with other audiences. And the process of teaching to reading is helping students have an awareness of that code and to break it and to follow it themselves. And different languages are going to represent these different codes. So thinking about how we can learn more about students' home languages and the, the rules and norms within the text with that respective language and helping students see similarities and differences as they engage with reading in, through the use of an American English uh, language use in the context of a US classroom. Um, and with that phonics knowledge, also thinking about how we can make that a multimodal experience. So kind of pushing back on the pro prolific use of worksheets, how can we help students engage with phonics knowledge and exploration through other means, whether that's um, uh, sorts of, of activities, um, uh, word sorts or th the development of words and manipulation of words through whiteboard or slate activities or with something more tactile like Play-Doh. You see a variety of other materials reflected here in the screenshots, as well as digital um, resources that can also enhance learning. And then making these connections to the text that they see in their neighboring communities, whether that's um, local market ads or um, other examples that they can find or locate or explore um, outside the school walls. A fifth element is fluency and independent reading. So we want our students to actively and repetitively engage with this reading process so that their reading becomes fluent, fluent meaning it's accurate, we have a, a rate um, that allows them to really focus on the meaning as opposed to decoding the words. We want students to be able to read with expression, to make appropriate pauses with punctuation and inflections with punctuation, to really be able to, be able to engage with the meaning behind text. And so when we think about that, uh, fluency practice, again, doesn't have to just be rereading re um, through worksheets, but it can involve um, reread multiple readings through um, digital sources, poetry, song lyrics, or even the development of readers theater where students get a script and they have to rehearse and prepare for a performance also to build that motivation and engagement. A sixth element is vocabulary. And so thinking about also the different types of vocabulary words, tier two being those like 
SAT words, if you will, those academic words that students will see in multiple contexts, or tier versus tier three words, which are oftentimes content specific words. How do we create opportunities for students to engage with a variety of vocabulary in English as well as their home languages? And how do they make connections to what they see outside the context of their school? Uh, so in their neighborhoods or households, how can they share those, um, whether that's like taking a screenshot or a photo of something that they've found or sharing it in a digital space. Also thinking about something that families could get involved in too. A seventh element is comprehension. So this of course is the ability to read, listen to, or understand text. Um, inviting students to retell what they read in a story with families, but also thinking about um, retelling a news story that maybe those in their household uh, watch together or um, a song that they listen to. Um, and also even just responding to pictures, making some inferences about what they see in a really interesting magazine or book. And finally, lots of opportunities for students to write again in English or, or their home language. This can include letters to a pen pal or a family member, a book about their family history, or for students, or, or, and not even just families, recognizing that families look different, but then also can constitute um, narratives for students who've gone through foster care or the adoption process, like really broadening understandings of, of households and, and communities. Um, also thinking about writing in terms of comic books or comic strips, journals, recipe books, drawing from photos of community. All of these can be things to enhance the writing process. Um, and finally, building connections and fostering critical thinking. We've talked about this throughout the session today, but also thinking about how this can connect to what's going on um, in students' lives at the local and global level. So creating spaces for them to share what's on their mind based on what's going on in their community or in some of their, uh, like some of the countries that represent their heritage. Maybe they have family members that are still in those countries. How do we create spaces for them to share what's going on in their lives and to make connections to reading and writing in that process and using that as a way for them to leverage um, their learning, but also to express and share their narratives if they're comfortable or to the extent to which they're comfortable doing so. And so finally, I wanted to just share at least one brief example of what this could look like when put together. Uh, again, thinking about culturally responsive approaches to literacy and reading being this lens that we apply um, to our development of lessons and units, recognizing that we start from the standards and we, we have these very specific and targeted learning goals that we want students to meet and thinking about how their intersectional social identities, their funds of knowledge, their experiences, perspectives, and narratives can, can enhance their connections to these content areas. Um, here I have, uh, I wanted to showcase this really awesome picture book called Drawn Together, which represents the experiences of a little boy who, whose um, home language of English does it, um, uh, makes it a little difficult for him to communicate with his grandfather, whose home language is not English, but they find this really engaging um, way to communicate with one another through their shared love of illustrating. And so um, this could be a really great book to serve as a, a launching pad for uh, your lesson. Um, you can create, invite students to create uh, sight words that you want to include or focus on throughout the lesson using letter manipulatives. Um, you can invite them to search for these sight words in the text with a partner or in a small group. You can invite them to engage in a picture walk with their shoulder buddies to share what they think is going to happen based on illustrations and other cues. Uh, the teacher can do a read aloud. 
And then students can in turn create their own graphic novel short story, welcoming the use of multiple languages or um, digital means as well as like illustration. Um, and so again, there's a variety of steps and scaffolds that we can create for students, but recognizing that um, the materials and the pedagogical moves that we use can be very intentional in thinking about how to connect all of these moving pieces and parts. Um, I thank you so much for engaging in this session and to coming along on this journey with me. Um, if you ever have any questions about this topic, feel free to reach out and to connect. Thank you again for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye.